15 minute or less lecture series anatomy and physiology chapter 12 blood blood a type of connective tissue is a fluid moving through our blood vessels it is a complex mixture of chemicals fluids and cells functions of blood include transporting substances throughout the body nutrients gases waste etc to help maintain a stable internal fluid environment the blood is the source of most fluids in our body including the fluids surrounding our cells and found in the tissues called the interstitial fluid, and it is to distribute heat. Uh, if you take blood from someone and look at it under a microscope, you'll see a variety of different kinds of cells referred to as formed elements. If you take that same blood and spin it down in a centrifuge, it will separate out so that the fluid, the plasma, ends up being approximately 55% by volume of the blood, while the red blood cells end up being approximately 45% of the uh, solution by volume, and there'll be a thin, thin little buffer coat, buffy coat, where you'll find the white blood cells and platelets. Uh, red blood cells are formed via erythropoiesis in the bone marrow, the red bone marrow, and there are hematopoietic stem cells that will produce all the blood cells. Some of them will go down the line to become red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells lose their nuclei and many organelles as they develop. This is why they're not considered real, true cells. They're formed elements. They lack mitochondria as well. So any ATP they produce is through glycolysis, type of fermentation, very inefficient, but does not need oxygen. So they don't use the oxygen they carry. And their average lifespan is approximately 120 days. Uh, they are biconcave discs. They're sort of indented in on both sides. Uh, this increases surface area so they can have more gas exchange across their membrane. Uh, when the hemoglobin within them binds to oxygen, it is a bright red. Uh, when the hemoglobin is no longer bound to oxygen, it becomes a darker red. So blood is never blue. It is always red. Uh, the number of red blood cells can vary. This is often measured to determine the blood's oxygen carrying capacity. Uh, this value is referred to as the hematocrit, so that the Percentage of red blood cells by volume in the blood is the hematocrit, usually around 45%. If there's a low level of red blood cells, then you might have anemia or low oxygen carrying capacity. Uh, red blood cells, again, are uh, stimulated to be produced in the red bone marrow by the hormone erythropoietin. So if there are low blood oxygen levels, then the liver and kidneys will release the hormone erythropoietin. It'll enter the bloodstream, go to the red bone marrow, increase the number of red blood cells being produced. This should then raise the uh, blood oxygen level and then stop the stimulus. Uh, it is possible to have too many red blood cells. This is called polycythemia. Um, this will end up leading to increased viscosity of the blood, making it thicker, slower moving. Heart has to work harder to move it. There's an increased blood pressure. Um, polycythemia, uh, polycythemia is often defined as being at a hemocritic value of 55% or greater. Uh, there are various uh, dietary factors that influence blood cell production. You need an ad adequate amount of vitamins B12 and folic acid. They're important for DNA synthesis. So even though the red blood cells lack a nucleus, uh, during the process, a nucleus needs to be present. So uh, these minerals and vitamins need to be at high enough levels. Um, you also need iron. Iron is needed for functional hemoglobin. If you don't have iron, then Hemoglobin can't bind to oxygen, uh, so the body tries to hold on to and recycle iron at all costs. And again, if you have either too few red blood cells or not enough iron for the hemoglobin, then you get anemia, low oxygen carrying capacity. Anemia symptoms can include yellowing in the eyes, paleness, coldness, shortness of breath, a change in stool color, heart palpations, dizziness, fainting. This all depends on exactly what is causing things anemia. Is it because of red blood cells rupturing too soon? Is it because not enough red blood cells are being produced? Is it because of blood loss, say internal bleeding? Or is it caused by a genetic disorder called sickle cell anemia? Um, in this disorder, the red blood cells are sort of sickle shaped, these little jagged points and they tend to rupture in the blood vessels. Uh, the normal life cycle of the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, again, starts in the red bone marrow where they are produced using nutrients that, of course, arrive from the digestive system. Uh, the red blood cells roam around in the bloodstream for about 120 days, and then the aged red blood cells are recycled in the liver and spleen. So the liver and spleen break down old red blood cells. Uh, then the liver gets those uh, components of the red blood cells 
and breaks down the hemoglobin to globin and heme. Uh, iron is then recycled, sent back to the red bone marrow for the next set of red blood cells. And the heme gets turned into bil biliverdin, which becomes bilirubin, which is found in bile and released into the small intestine to aid in digestion. Uh, leukocytes are white blood cells. White blood cells defend against disease. Uh, they can leave the bloodstream to go into tissues to fight infection, and their lifespan can go from anywhere from 12 hours to decades, depends on the kind. Uh, there are two big categories for leukocytes. There are the granular leukocytes, which include eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, and the eight granular leukocytes called lymphocytes and monocytes. Granular leukocytes have large granules in their cytoplasm. A granular leukocytes lack those. These are the leukocytes that are found in blood, but they are not all the different kinds of leukocytes. Uh, basophils have large, rounded, uh, dark purple-blue uh, granules, often making it hard to see the nucleus. They are larger than red blood cells. What basophils do is release histamine to intensify inflammation. This sometimes is used in excessive amounts during allergic reactions. And basophils can also release heparin to inhibit blood clotting to thin the blood, as it were. Eosinophils, they have large orangish red uh, granules in their cytoplasm. They have a two to three lobe nucleus, larger than blood cells. Uh, they release enzymes to counter inflammation. So they counter inflammation, especially in allergic reactions. They also can attack parasitic uh, pathogens infecting the body, especially large things like parasitic worms. Neutrophils, neutrophils have a uh, evenly distributed pale lilac granules in their cytoplasm, two to five lobe nucleus, larger than blood cells. They are very active in phagocytosis. They engulf bacteria, pathogens, any cell debris that is scattered about these things they engulf, then get exposed to the enzymes in the lysosomes. And neutrophils are active both in the bloodstream and in tissues, and they are the most common kind of leukocyte. Lymphocytes, have a very little bit of cytoplasm. You can see usually the sky blue in color. They have a nucleus that tends to fill most of the cell that is roundish or maybe dimpled. They often are about the red size of red blood cells, although they can be bigger. There are different kinds of lymphocytes, but under the light microscope, we can't tell the difference. Uh, these include B lymphocytes that are important for antibody production, helper T lymphocytes that regulate the specific immune response, and cytotoxic T lymphocytes that destroy infected Cells, cells infected by specific pathogens. Monocytes. Monocytes are larger than blood cells. They have a kidney-shaped or um, horseshoe-shaped uh, nucleus and a gray-bluish sort of cytoplasm. Um, they do not function in the blood, but when they enter tissues, they become macrophages, and macrophages will engage in phagocytosis. They will engulf microbes, cellular so debris, and dispose of them using lysosomes. So these are the five main leukocytes you can see in the blood. Often when you get a blood sample taken, they will count the different kinds of white blood cells to see if there's any issues. So for instance, if you have, are having a lot of allergies, then you might have an increased number of basophils. Uh, leukocytosis basically just means an increase in number of leukocytes, which could be a specific subcategory based on what's going on with your body. Leukemia is a group of red bone marrow cancers, cancers in the red bone marrow. It leads to massive production of abnormal, non-functional white blood cells that then interfere with other blood cell production. So normal blood versus someone with leukemia. This then leads to anemia, leads the person to be more, more prone to infections, basically very, very serious condition. Um, this can be treated by a bone marrow transplant. The recipient has their red bone marrow destroyed via anti-cancer drugs and radiation. Then a healthy donor who is a good match will then have some red bone marrow removed and placed into the bones of the recipient, giving them a new healthy type of red bone marrow. Okay, platelets. Platelets are also produced in the red bone marrow via hematopoietic stem cell division. They will become these large megokaryocytes. The megokaryocytes will then bleb off little bitty bits of their cells. That is what the platelets are. Platelets are not true cells. Um, an increase in production of platelets is caused by the release of the hormone thrombopoietin. Uh, platelets can help damage, uh, repair damaged blood vessels by adhering to the broken edges of these blood vessels and control blood loss. Uh, then we got plasma. Plasma is the fluid portion of the uh, blood, about 55%. It 
It carries and has many things dissolved in it, gases, nutrients, electrolytes, etc. The best pH for your blood is 7.35 to 7.45. And all of our various fluids in our body come from the plasma of the blood. The fluids around cells, fluid called lymph, the cerebral spinal fluid, etc. Uh, found in plasma are three types uh, groups of plasma proteins. The albumins. Albumins are there to maintain high osmotic pressure so that water and other things will want to move into the bloodstream. Uh, globulins. There are three types of globulins. Uh, two of them, alpha and beta, transport lipids and fat-soluble vitamins and hormones. Basically, things that are hydrophobic need help to move in the bloodstream. And the gamma globulins are the antibodies that fight specific infections. There's also fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is an inactive form of a protein called fibrin that is important for blood clotting. So fibrinogen is there in the bloodstream all the time, waiting for a damage that needs to be repaired with a blood clot. Uh, there are various gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, various nutrients, amino acids, monosaccharides, nucleotides, etc., coming from the digestive tract. And of course, the hydrophobic lipids being carried by the globulins. There are waste, urea and uric acid. These are waste byproducts from uh, protein and nucleic acid catabolism and are removed by the kidneys in the form of urine. Uh, various electrolytes, we have sodium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, etc., including hydrogen ions, which what are what cause the pH, and we want the pH of blood to be 7.35 to 7.45. Uh, when there is damage to blood vessels, we have a process called hemostasis that has three main uh, approaches to limiting blood loss. There's the blood vessel spasming after it's cut. It contracts. It's smaller, reduces blood uh, loss. Uh, platelets will also re release serotonin, which further causes a constricting of the walls of the blood vessels. Platelets will then adhere to the broken edges of the blood vessel and try to form a net or plug, a platelet plug that will block the loss of blood. Um, this is ideal in small vessels. Uh, we also get blood coagulation. The damaged tissues release chemicals, so does the platelets, and this causes fibrinogen to become fibrin. And the fibrin will then form a mesh that catches red blood cells and basically clots and limits blood loss. Uh, eventually, the clot needs to be removed, so there's this other protein, plasmogen, that becomes plasmin that helps to break down fibrin. And fibroblasts will, of course, arrive to start the repair of the damaged tissues. It's possible that you can develop a blood clot that you don't need, abnormally formed, called a thrombus. And if it gets dislodged and starts moving through the bloodstream, it's called an embolus. Um, this could then block blood vessels, especially blood vessels that have been um, the subject to the formation of plaques along its walls, which would be called atherosclerosis. Uh, this could then lead to the lumen, the space in the blood vessel, to get smaller and easier for a blood clot to block. Uh, antigens are things found on the surface of our cells, uh, and leukocytes and antibodies see these antigens and will bind to them if it's from a foreign cell. Antigens are also found on our erythrocytes. They are the A and or B antigens and also the Rho antigen. So if you have blood type A, that means you have A antigen on your red blood cells and you have anti-B antibodies. If you have B blood type, you have B antigens on your red blood cells and antibodies against A. People with AB blood have both A and B antigens and no uh, Antibodies and people with type O have no antigens and antibodies against both types. You also have Rh positive and negative. Positive means you have the Rh antigen and negative means you don't and you have antibodies against it. And the whole point is that when you get a blood transfusion, you want to make sure you have the right type of blood. You want a type of blood that has the same antigens or less so there's no problems. Problems would be caused because antibodies in your blood would bind to these new blood cells that are not uh, right, that are possessing antigens that you have antibodies against. This leads to these huge blood clots that can become a um, major blocking lots of vessels, leading to strokes, heart attack, and death. And that is it for this lecture.